Brings a little new perspective to that song, does it not? Man, I hope so. I like it y'all's way better than the way I've sung it in the past. You know what? We're going to be in a lot of different passages today. Uh, i got to ask your forgiveness for some of you. I've been asked uh, to provide some cross-references up on the screen when I start bouncing around too much. I'm going to make a genuine effort to start doing that. Today is not that day, though. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to throw it out there, all right? So we're, we're going to be bouncing around a lot more than usual because today's a topical. I always say this, and some of y'all are probably tired of me saying it, you know, if we do something different. Uh, but it's just important to me that you guys understand the way that we view uh, teaching the Bible on a regular basis. We're a verse-by-verse teaching church. We're in the book of Judges right now. We'll be back in Judges next week. This week is a topical. I only say that because if you're not used to our church, if you're visiting, if you're checking things out, I just want you to understand that's kind of where we're at. That's where our sweet spot. Uh, but we're dealing with a topical message today uh, and something that could, uh, I don't know, produce some interesting reactions, all right? And I need all the time I can get, so I'm not going to waste time telling you guys how Georgia should have been in the FBF, you know, should have been in the playoff, you know, chase or anything like that today. We're just going to jump in because we uh, we got we got to get after this. All right, y'all ready? Y'all good? Y'all ready to go? You strapped in? Okay, energized after Christmas season. Okay, Uh, feeling good. If you're not, why are you here? Watch the video we posted on Mondays. Okay, you know, (laughs) just saying, it's just for me. If nobody else, all right. Okay, all right. Um, No messing around. Let's pray. We'll get started. Father God, we're grateful for the opportunity to come together and to worship your name. Father, we are, uh, well, we're just, we're just blessed a lot more than I'm sure we understand, um, at least speaking for myself. And Father, I just confess now that, that your Holy Spirit inspired your word, Father. Uh, this is your work, and it's authoritative. It's inspired. And uh, Father, we're dependent upon your Holy Spirit uh, also to help us understand it. And uh, especially to, to lead us to your heart in these things. So many of these things can be interpreted so legally, Father. So help us to see your heart in these passages that we're going to talk through today. Um, and Father, I pray that um, you would lead us into obedience in these things. And that through our offerings of the first fruits to you, that we would see fruit in that. Spiritual fruit in that, in us and around us. Uh, because of that principle. Father, we thank you, we love you, we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, the title of the message this morning is, If You Ain't First, You Last. Okay. Now, it's funny because that quote comes out of a movie that I've never even seen, but have y'all noticed how a lot of things will make it into our culture and then they become a part of our vocabulary? You know what I'm saying? All right. Well, the focus of the message today is around the idea of first, or again, as I told you in our prayer time this morning, first fruits. Now, I'm also aware that in our culture, there are very different ideas and very different levels of importance when it comes to being first. So let me give you an example. First one is this quote. If you ain't first, you're last. What does that mean? It means that second place is no better than being the first loser. That's another interpretation of that phrase. That puts a very high level of importance on winning and on being first. Okay, I'll give you another one, kind of in the same vein. If you ain't cheating, you ain't what? You ain't trying. Okay, If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. I'm not advocating that. Some of y'all are just staring at me. I'm just saying... Some people put such a high level of importance on winning that they'll deflate footballs, New England Patriots. Okay, but I'm not going to name any names. We're not going to get specific on this. I'm just saying some people put maybe an inappropriate level of importance on winning. And then you go to the other side of the equation where people have taken away the importance of winning. And they may something like, well, it's not about whether you win or lose, but what? It's how you play the game. And now some of you are like, oh, here goes the participation trophy culture coming out. And some of y'all will talk about that for like an hour and a half. This is what's wrong with our whole cultures. Everybody gets a trophy. Nobody wins. There is no second place. We're all winners out here. I don't want to get y'all started on that because that could take our whole time today. That's not the point. But first does have a level of importance in God's economy. Would y'all agree with that statement? Does first have a level of importance in God's economy? Yes or no? Absolutely it does. Okay? Let me, I, I'm going to start us out right here. This is where, this was a personal study for me 
that I decided to share with you guys, and I cannot get into the level of detail, honestly, that I would even like to, but I'm going to give you enough to chew on today that if you want to study this for all of 2019, you could probably get started on it, okay? That this idea of the first fruits. Now, I want to take you back to introduce you to this concept, to a passage that we taught through in our In the Beginning series when we went verse by verse through the entire book of Genesis. I want to take you back to Genesis chapter 4. Uh, by the way, you almost never hear me say this, but do not feel like you have to turn to your Bible for every passage that I'm going to talk about today. Okay? Just, just don't feel like you have to do that. You might go crazy before you leave today. Okay? Uh, I'll also tell you this. We don't always do this. We'll post a little outline for you on the Facebook page. So when Jeff posts the message late tonight or tomorrow morning, we'll put up a little Word document up there so that you can, download, so that you can see these references and you can go back and start your own study of these things to help out a little bit. And I will try to do better at the future about putting cross-references up on the screens. I think that's legitimate. Genesis 4, verse 1. Now, the man had relations with his wife Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of that time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. This is where it gets interesting, though. Verse 5, But for Cain and for his offering, he had, God had, no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, simple question. Does the Scripture tell us why God regarded one offering and did not regard the other offering? Yes or no? No. It does not overtly tell us. But I want to point you back to something in the Scripture right here in verse 4. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock. Does it say that same thing about Cain and the fruits of the ground? No, it doesn't, okay? I think there's an inference there that we can start to kind of deduce what the problem was with Cain's offering versus Abel's offering. I believe, based on some context clues in the Scripture, that Abel brought, Abel brought the first of his flocks. In other words, he brought the best of his flocks, okay? This was the idea. The idea was motive. The idea was heart that made one sacrifice acceptable to God and make the, made the Lord have no regard for the other sacrifice. Okay? Now I want you to see this in the idea, this usage of the word first fruits. I'm going to flip over to Leviticus 23, verse 10. Here's what it says. This is the Lord speaking to Moses these things to instruct the people of Israel. Verse 10. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land which I'm going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. Verse 17, you shall bring in from your dwelling place two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. Verse 20, the priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priest. Okay? Let me give you another a New Testament context for this. And if you want to start your study, this, this is what I did. I looked at this word first fruits. I went to Blue Letter Bible. Okay? I typed in the word first fruits. Depending on your translation, it may be two words. Maybe one word, it may be two words. I hit enter, okay? And it gave me every verse that this idea of first fruits was mentioned in both the New and the Old Testament. That's where you can go to begin your study on this principle of the first fruits. And where I found it was many times in the Old Testament, it was used in the context of sacrifices and offerings to God, okay? And we're going to talk about that as we go. But is first fruits also a new covenant and a New Testament idea? Yes or no? It absolutely is. James 1.18 is only one of several examples, but I'll give it to you as an example of a New Testament usage of first fruits. And it says this, In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of, his, of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. 
And we're going to see several instances of this principle of first fruits in a New Testament context. And we're going to try to connect the two. Because I very much believe that the Holy Spirit is the author of all Scripture. That is where it gets its authority from, is that God is the author and not man. And also, it's why it's all connected, okay? It's not just a bunch of old dudes from different, you know, different continents and different countries and different languages over 1,500 years. It's one God who put together one cumulative work of His authoritative Word as a gift to His people to help guide us and help us walk according to His will, okay? It's one work. And so you see the principles, whether it's Old Covenant, Old Testament, New Covenant, New Testament, the principles connect, and it's our idea to decipher, it's our job to decipher with the the help and the leadership of the Holy Spirit and to see how it all kind of fits together. And that's a part of what we're going to do today. So I'm going to try to keep it real simple. I'm going to try to give you a lot of scriptural references so you can go back and do your homework, okay, because I am cherry-picking today. And that's one of the reasons that we're not a typically topically teaching church is so we're not cherry picking. We're putting things in context so that you can see where these things come from. So let's start out with this. And a lot of this will be up on the screen. But again, we'll put it on Facebook as well so that you don't have to take all these notes if you would rather just listen and go back and hit some of this stuff later. So question, what is a first fruit? Very simply put, very simply put, it is the first and the best of almost anything you have. A first fruit can be almost anything. And you're going to see us define these things as we go. But it typically is the first and the best of anything you have. Okay, That's where we're going to start. All right. Now, let's define it a little bit more. What is a first fruit? Okay. What is a first fruit as we continue to define it? It could be... And here are some examples. Hebrews 13, 15 says this, Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, so that is, the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. So a first fruit can be an offering of praise. So every time that you come together congregationally for worship, and we crank the band up, and they start singing and playing, do you have an opportunity to bring God a first fruit? Yes, you do, through your praise. This is one of the reasons that worship is a part of our vision as a church. It's the reason that we do worship. We don't just do it because churches do worship. That is not why we worship at our church, okay? We worship because this is a part of us bringing our best to God. And the fruit of our lips, our praise, is an offering and a first fruit before God. Let me ask you a question. Do you worship in that way? Do you worship in that way? That when you open up your mouth or when you raise your hands, that your heart is saying, I'm giving you the best of what I've got right now. I had a terrible week, but I'm here to give you the best because you deserve it. I'm not in a great place right now, but I'm here to give you the best because you deserve it. Here's my first fruit offering through the praise of my lips. Can that dynamically transform the way that you worship? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Okay. What else can be a first fruit? Psalm 50, 14 says, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. What can be another type of first fruit? Thanksgiving. Okay, I'm not just talking about the meal, although I am exceedingly grateful to God that we have that meal on Thanksgiving Day. Okay, It's awesome. All right? But I'm just talking about the attitude of gratefulness for the things that we have, our thanksgiving. Like, how is it that you answer when people ask you what you're grateful for? Is, do, does your mouth have a reply at the tip of your tongue? Okay, that, that can tell us sometimes if we're actually grateful, if we're thankful for the things that we have. And our thanksgiving to God for the blessings that we have, whatever they may be, even if they're not exactly what you would want them to be, this is a first fruit before God, is thanksgiving that flows out of us for everything that we've been given. Now, I don't think I'm stretching on this one, okay? But again, you can do the Bible homework. Be a Berean. You're not supposed to trust everything I'm saying just because i got a microphone and a Bible, okay? I believe that biblically our children can be a first fruit before God. Let me give you an example. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 um, 
she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, this is Hannah's praying before God, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord. What was the name of that son who was born to her when God opened her womb? That was Samuel, okay? That was Samuel. Samuel was a first fruit of Hannah's womb, okay? Um, I, I think in a certain way you could look at Jesus being a first fruit of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave who? His only begotten son, right? Okay. Jesus was a first fruit of God. I believe that we can look at our children as first fruits to be given back to the Lord. Our first and our best. And I don't just mean that as the oldest, all right? Like, God, you can have the oldest. The rest of them are all for me, okay? They're there for me to spend however I want. That, that's not the point, okay? What I'm saying is our children are the best of us, okay? And they need to be given over to the Lord. We need to seriously consider that in our parenting, okay? Is that they belong to the Lord. We're going to see this in Judges, by the way. Um, if y'all haven't read Judges, it is off the chain, all right? Um, we're going to be reading the story of Samson. Now, Samson was a morally perfect character in the Bible, that was a joke for those who have read Judges, okay? Um, but one of the things that did set Samson apart in the way that God used him is he was what was known as a Nazarite, okay? He was a Nazarite. He was set apart by his parents, according to the word of the Lord, to God for to be used for his purposes. I think there's a manner of speaking that all of our children should be dedicated in that same way, that they are set aside for the ministry and the purposes of God. Not that that means they're all going to be vocational pastors. This would be a boring, jacked-up world if every child every Christian had was going to go in vocational ministry. Okay, But I'm saying that they would be poured out and used for God's purposes in whatever He called them to do and whatever abilities and talents He gave them. You understand what I'm saying? That's what I mean by having them as a first fruit uh, of our lives. Okay, Romans 12 verse 1, what else can be first fruits? Romans 12 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So what can be another type of first fruit? Our very lives. Like our lives. Everything about us poured out on the altar of sacrifice in an act of worship for God. This is the manner of life that God calls us to. This is the manner of life that God calls us to. And frankly, this is what encapsulates the reason for this message with first fruits. I want you to think back to 2018. If a first fruit of giving to God is our very lives, everything that we are, not just our physical bodies, but everything that makes us up, mind, body, spirit, and soul, given over to God first, is that the, does that describe your manner of living in 2018? Y'all don't even want to shake your head. Well, I'll jump in with you. Me neither, okay? I mean, that's the unfortunate reality is we don't live in that manner of thinking all the time, okay? There is area of growth. There is room for sanctification in my life that I would bring my life to God as a first fruit before Him. And I've got to keep that goal before me all the time. Not that I will be perfect. Not that I will be sinless. Not that I will live in perfection. Thank God for grace. Amen? But this is the goal that we are striving for, is to offer our lives before God as a first fruit before Him. And there's so much growth that can happen in my life in 2019 if I will keep this as my goal. All right. Now, I want to point out to you, look at the types of first fruits that we've talked about so far. We talked about praise. We talked about thanksgiving. We talked about our children. We talked about our very lives. What have we not even talked about yet? We haven't even talked about money. We haven't even talked about it. Now, obviously, you know it's coming. Like, let's not dance around the issue here. Like, you know it's coming, okay? But that's part of what I need you guys to see. It's first fruits, and the principle of first fruits is not just about the dollar that we give to a church or an organization or charitably or whatever the case may be. It is so much bigger than that, okay? It's our lives. It's our time. It's our treasure, but it's also our talents. It's every resource that God gives us because we are stewards of all those resources 
because they belong to Him, and they are to be used for His purposes. So simply put, do you understand that first fruits is much more than money, yes or no? Absolutely. Now, um, when I started doing my study of first fruits, I started with the Word. I just started doing my own study, looking through every mention of first fruits, reading it, putting it in context a little bit, you know, doing some cross references, looking to see what the words meant, like things like that. Later on, I went to uh, you know Doctor Google and started asking him about it. And what I found out very quickly was is that the principle of first fruits seems to be talked about mostly in prosperity focused churches. Okay, I'm just calling a spade a spade. By the way, little caveat here today. I am not here to poke anybody in the eye or to throw rocks at anybody, but I am very plainly spoken. That's just who I am. I'm sorry. It just is what it is. Okay, this is mostly talked about in prosperity circles. Now, that was not a shock to me. And that's also why we need to talk about the money aspect, because I want you to hear about it. And what I feel like is more of like the heart of God, like from his word. You understand what I'm saying? And besides that, some of y'all didn't come up in prosperity circles. Because if you came up in prosperity circles, here's basically what you heard the majority of the time. You need to give so that, one purpose, so that you, what? Will be blessed. So that you will receive. Now, I'm not telling you that's completely wrong. I'm not saying that's completely wrong, but that's all you heard, okay? You need to give me, or you need to give to us, so that you will be blessed. And if you are not giving to me or to us, then you will not be blessed, okay? Like it was really that simple, even if it wasn't used in those terms. Now, some of you guys are from much more conservative churches. So what you heard was 10%, 10%, 10%. If not, you're a loser, okay? Now, they may not have said it exactly that way. Matter of fact, they probably didn't say it exactly that way, okay? Now, I'm, I'm just curious, okay? Because I am trying, I am playing with y'all a little bit because I like to have fun. I, I, like, I honestly like to have fun up here. I feel like I'm exercising my spiritual gifts and that that's actually something that's fun. I, I believe that, okay? But how many of y'all actually grew up basically hearing that a lot? It's 10%, 10%, and if you don't give it, you're a loser, okay? All right, you see what I'm saying? All right? I mean, I, I, I felt like a lot of y'all would feel that okay so let, let's do this let's talk tithes let's talk tithes okay we'll talk about it we'll talk about tithes just a little bit okay so here we go okay uh in the old testament and by the way let me tell you how i got here years ago i heard from so many different churches in different denominations 10 percent, 10 percent, 10 percent. if you don't give it you're a loser i heard that in my christian life so many times that at some point I started reading enough of the Bible to think, I don't think that's right. And so I started studying myself. I went directly to the Word, and I started reading. And what I came up with was different than what I felt like I'd been taught for all those years. Okay, And, and I want you to know, there, there's no small amount of controversy around some of the ideas I'm about to show you. These, some people will argue these things until they're blue in the face. And I think they miss the forest for the trees, so to speak, trying to be right on all the details. So I'm not going to tell you that my take on all these things is right. I'm going to tell you what I believe is true, and I'll let you know that this is my opinion on some things that some people debate. Okay. So when I went back to the Word, after having been taught the tithe over and over and over and over again, as I went to the Word, and what looked like the Word said is it looked like there were multiple tithes under Mosaic law. Okay, it looked like there were multiple ties. Now, just to be transparent with y'all, the two sides of the argument say this. One side says there are three tithes, okay, three separate tithes. The other side says there's one tithe used for three purposes, okay, right? And I need you to understand there are really good Bible teachers and really godly people on both sides of the argument, okay? Y'all need to understand, y'all need to hear that. But when I went to the Word for myself, with nobody telling me what to think or what to believe or whatever the case may be, I came to the conclusion that it looked like there were three different tithes given in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law. Okay, 
So that's, I'm just putting it out there. So those three tithes, the first one is this. It was called the Levitical tithe. This is Numbers 18, 21 through 24. Very simply put, this was like a nationwide, almost like a tax, but it was a tithe that was given for the purposes of support, supporting the tribe of Levi. Now, if y'all know your Bible history, the tribe of Levi had no inheritance in the land. So this was their only support, okay? They weren't given parcels of land to, to go out and farm and make money and things like this. This was the manner of support for the Levites, including those among the Levites who were the priesthood, okay? So this was a tithe that went to support almost like the governmental system of the Jews as well as their system of worship and to support the priesthood among the Jewish people. Okay, by the way, uh, the, the word tithe, y'all, y'all know the answer to this one. What, what does it mean, literally? It means a tenth. It means 10%, okay? So that's why the argument matters between whether it's three tithes or one tithe for three purposes, okay? Because it impacts the bottom line depending on which one was true, all right? So Levitical tithe, Numbers 18, 21 through 24. The second one, uh, a tithe for feasts or festivals, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 27, now, this tithe was really, really interesting, okay? Because what it did is almost like, think of Joseph with Mary going back to his hometown to register for the census, right? Like the Jews would go back to their places of birth, okay? This was kind of like this. This was like a national religious holiday where the Jews would come back together in Jerusalem and they would bring their offering and they would have a throwdown, like the biggest potluck lunch you've ever seen in your life. Okay, This was a celebration. It was an act of worship. It was an act of giving. It was like a national holiday. They all participated together, but the people actually got to eat from the offering that was being given. Okay, It was a huge celebratory, worshipful party where they participated all through this act of giving or tithing. Okay, Then, the third one, this was a tithe for the poor. Okay, The tithe for the poor. The tithe for the poor was given once every three years. Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29. Now, the tithe to the poor wasn't all just brought to Jerusalem. This was stored, the money and the food was given to each individual town because it was for the poor in each area that the Jews possessed. So to some degree, this was almost a community project. Okay, This was like, some of y'all will think this is a political statement and it's not, but to some degree, this was like God's welfare system. This was God providing a way to take care of the poor and the stranger and the alien and the widow and the orphan who were among the people of Israel. Okay. Now, I also want you to know, and think about this, I think the heart of God is awesome if you pay attention to it. A lot of people throw stones at the law of God and they, they pick at, they cherry pick certain things and they say this is stupid and this is dumb and this is so archaic and we're so far past this and God endorses this and it's gross and this, that, and the other. They, they usually don't uncover much at all. They just look right at the surface and they, they don't really look for the heart of God in any of these things, okay? Number one, God would have the people to bring the tithe for the poor, and the leaders of the church were responsible for stewarding that and for taking care of the poor and the widow and the orphan and and things like the stranger among the people. But also, he also made provision in the law that every person was responsible for the poor. If you had a field and if you were a farmer, what were you not supposed to do? Do y'all remember? You weren't supposed to glean all the way to the corner. Who were the corners for? Those are for the poor, okay? So the provision of God, his heart for those who had need among them, was a church project and it was an individual project. You understand what I'm saying? It was we're all in this together. That was the heart of God. Don't y'all think that's fascinating? Do y'all think that's a good example for us today? Okay, yes. By the way, um, do y'all think when we look at these tithes, I want you to think about this. The tithes to support The church, call it that, okay? The tithe for this celebratory act of national worship. The tithe for the poor. If we really think through these things, and if they do align with the heart of God, should they have some implications for the way that we budget and the way that we do church? What do y'all think? What's made me think, okay? 
It, it's, it's just made me think. It's made me think about where our resources go and how they're used and how they should be structured and all those kinds of things. They have implications for us as individuals and they have implications for our churches okay, as well. All right. Here's the other thing I would say. When you look at these tithes, these Old Testament tithes, um, it sounds very much to me, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily sound like this cold, rigid, calculated law. It doesn't just sound like money. You know what it sounds like when I really think about these things in context? It sounds like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the tithe system sounds like to me. Okay? Because by bringing our first and bringing our best to God, what we're saying is we love you more than the resource. Okay? The first belongs to you. It was given by you. It belongs to you. And this is one of the best ways to keep our heart free from greed, which is a, a source of all kinds of wickedness is the love of money. Okay? And then secondly, part of this was a provision for those who are in need. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is really the Old Testament law, you know, that so many people like to pick on and talk about God being, you know, mean and evil and hateful and all these kinds of things. That's really the summary of these things. Okay, now, here, here's where we're going to change it up a little bit. Oh, by the way, before I go any further, um, if, if these were three separate tithes, did the people of Israel give 10% of their income to God? Yes or no? No, not if there were three tithes, okay? Because 10%, 10%, 10% does not equal 10%, okay? I don't know. In today's math, it might. That stuff's weird today. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how y'all do that stuff today. Like old school math, that's not what it equaled, okay? Uh, the basic idea is, is most of the side, uh, okay, that believes this was different tithes, okay, believe that most people in Israel gave about 23% or so in tithe. Why? Because you gave a 10% and then what you had left, you gave a 10%, what you had left, you gave a 10%. So it was a little bit decreasing in scale, okay? So it was it didn't equal up to straight up 30%. Most people that believe that there were different tithes believe the people of Israel gave a tithe of 23%. So since we're a tithe teaching church, that's what we're going to require of you guys from here forward. <laughs> Wait, that was not comedic. Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> No, all right. But that, that's why it's interesting. Matter of fact, John MacArthur is one of the guys who's on my side on this issue, okay? We're not on the same side on all issues, all right? But th on this one, we're on the same side. Um, he said a person in Israel, like, for say, say during Jesus' time, if you took the taxes they paid to the government along with the, the tithing system that they were under, under the old covenant, that they were given a baseline of 40% off the top, Okay. I'm talking about like bottom of the calculation. It went up from there. They were given at least 40% of their money to tithe and taxes. Okay. Just for comparison's sake, because I just think it's really interesting like, to think through those things. All right, now, let me say something to you that you may be surprised to hear. Okay? I, I don't know, depending on what you think about us as a church. But I'm, I'm just telling you, when I say we're not throwing rocks at other churches or people, I, I, I'm vision casting a little bit for this is who we are as a church. Okay, So let me say this very plainly. Personally, I don't see tithing as a requirement. Did y'all hear that? Personally, I don't see tithing. What does tithing mean? Giving 10%. Personally, I don't see tithing as a requirement under the new covenant of grace. So we defined what tithing was like under the old covenant. All right. Now, the, the next slide is going to be why we shouldn't tithe. Y'all like that? <laughs> why we shouldn't tithe. Well, it's going to be really, really simple. Okay. First of all, Romans 6, 14 through 15. Uh, it very simply says, without going to the passage, we are not under law, but we are under what? We are under grace, okay? We're not under law, but we are under grace, okay? I mentioned the whole thing, too, uh, about percentages to say this. If we're going to teach everything according to the Old Testament law, the Old Covenant law, and if it really was three, you know, um, different ties then we shouldn't just be teaching people they should give 10%. We should be using the tithe to say, hey, you need to be giving about a quarter of your income 
off the top, the gross, not the net, you should be giving a quarter of your income to the church. Like, we should be teaching it that way. So in my opinion, we were teaching in a lot of our churches, we're teaching law, and we're teaching law wrong, which is kind of funny, okay? And, and I just don't believe that that's what we're called to do under the new covenant of grace. Second thing, why we shouldn't tithe. Well, we make what is known in the Old Testament as free will offerings. Free will offerings. By the way, y'all know how I gave y'all the 40% number a minute ago for what, you know, a, a Jew in Jerusalem, you know, during the birth of Christ would have maybe given in tithes and taxes? Y'all know they had a bunch of festivals too, right? They had se- like seven different festivals, okay? Feast of Tabernacles and booths and, um, you know, Passover and Festivus for the rest of us. And, I mean, there, there were like, there were a lot of like feasts and festivals, like 10 of y'all got that. Um, there were all these feasts and festivals, and they would also bring offerings when they came to the feasts and the festivals, okay? They, they, they brought, I mean, they were bringing offerings, they were bringing a lot to the table uh, when it came to their givings, okay? Now, uh, we make free will, spontaneous, uh, generous offerings. I'll read you this in Genesis chapter 14. This goes back to our Genesis study as well, and I think this is really, really interesting. Genesis 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, or Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Abram gave to Melchizedek, the priest, a tenth of all that he had. He gave him a what? Fill in the blank. A tithe. Now, what's interesting about that passage? Y'all tell me. What's really interesting about Abram giving a tithe in that passage? What's that? It, it predates the law. All right? I mean, think about that. His giving predates the Mosaic law in which the tithe was defined. I find that highly, highly fascinating. That's why that even though I'm telling you I don't think that we're locked into the tithe, I still think the tithe can be a useful rule of thumb for us to consider when we consider our giving. Now, are any of y'all confused right now? Do you feel like I'm playing both sides? Okay. Let let me tell you something else. Uh, I felt comfortable giving this message because, frankly, um, My experience has been a lot of times that we don't talk about things that we're uncomfortable talking about or that we feel like people are going to be divided about, all right? I don't think that's healthy in the church. I think we have to have the conversations. We have to have the conversations. I want us to be a church that embraces the conversations. If you've been around in Genesis and if you've been around already in Judges, we are a church that embraces the difficult conversations, period, okay? That, that is what it is. We need to have those conversations in the church. The other reason I'm very comfortable having this conversation is, okay, number one, some of you guys have been here. We're, we're, a, we're a very old, long in the tooth church. We've been here for a whole 18 months, okay? And in that entirety of our, you know, that, that old age of 18 months, I promise you we've talked about giving for a grand total of somewhere less than 10 minutes cumulative in 18 months, Cumulative, like total, okay? You, ask, you can ask anybody that's here. Ask anybody that's been here for all that time. How many of y'all have been here for 18 months? There you go. Ask those guys with their hands up in the air, okay? We, 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 don't, we don't talk about it, and typically unless it comes up in the, in, the, you know, in the passage that we're studying verse by verse. Why today? Well, I feel like there needs to be sanctification, there needs to be growth, there needs to be better understanding and more of a biblical context for these things. But I'm also comfortable talking about these principles because of this reason. Listen to me. Because I have no complaints about where we're at in the giving in our church. God has provided for every need that our church has had up to this point. We have no building that we're about to put a down payment on. We don't have something that we're requiring, you know, money that we don't have. There is no motive behind, hey, we need, we need you to make out your year, you know, year end check, okay, in the next couple of days because we got to get the thing done. There's nothing, there's, it's not there. You understand what I'm saying? 
That's why I'm super, like, super comfortable. I don't even have to ask myself, well, are you really, in your heart of hearts, are you really thinking, well, it sure would be nice if some people stroked a big check like this week so we could get the thing done, all right? Like it's not there. Like we're good. We've been able to provide, you know, through your gifts for our staff and our needs of the church have been met and we're able to be generous to people in our body and outside of our body and we're growing in our giving and generosity. Like, I, I don't have any complaints. This is about sanctification. This is about personal growth. This is understanding of God's Word. This is about a true knowledge of what these things mean and, and how they can be used. That's what this is about. So I'm completely comfortable having that conversation. Just so you know, I'll give you my email address to show you how comfortable I am. It's richie at thechapelcleveland.com. Okay, you hear something today you don't understand, or you think, what do you think about this? Like, email me. We'll, we'll have some lunch. You know, we'll talk about it, whatever the case may be. Now, I don't think we should tithe, but I do think when you look at Abram, and there are other examples as well of people that gave a tenth in a manner of worship before the law was even instituted. That's why I find it appropriate to teach tithing as a general rule of thumb, not as a law. Okay, And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. So some qualifications. I talked about where we're at as a church, that our needs have been met. I'll also make you this promise. Um, if God blesses us with more resources, here's my promise to you guys as a church. We will attempt to stretch ourselves and to grow in generosity. And we will continue to save money for the future, not just spend it because it's in the bank account. Okay? So there's another qualification uh, for the church. Now, in terms of why I wanted to teach these things to you guys, listen, here's, here's my hope for you in terms of sanctification and growth. I want you to see your first fruits, not just your giving, but your giving, your time, your treasure, your talents, your gifts, all of those things. I want you to experience, for some of you, maybe for the first time, joy in using some of those things. I want you to experience, maybe for the first time, the missional experience of participating with your first fruits versus writing a check out of obligation. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to see your work transformed into ministry. I want you to see the fruit of your offering of first fruits rather than only seeing these things as obligations. That's why you need to see the heart of God behind these things so that there actually is fruit from what you're doing and it's not just a legal requirement in each of our lives. So let's talk about a godly way to filter and look at New Testament, New Covenant giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. This is the first passage that I'll share with you. Just a couple this morning. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come." When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Okay. Now this is in the context of a gift to a group of saints, but I want you to think about this. I think we can apply this to many of our gifts. Okay. First of all, he says in verse 2, on the first day of every week. Do you guys feel like it's appropriate for giving to be planned? Yeah, I really do. I think there's a biblical context for that. Planned. Each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper. What this speaks to me is that our giving is to be proportionate. I want you to think about something. Is God a common sense God? Yes. Does he treat everybody the same way? No. Some of y'all don't like that, but that's the truth. Okay. He does not treat everybody the same way. He does not give everybody access to the same resources. So then when it comes to giving, does he require the same of everyone to whom he has not given the same? No. Even under the law in the Old Testament, there were some who had been given much that they were supposed to bring the fattened calf. You understand? They were supposed to bring their best. The first fruits was something that was exceedingly generous and, and expensive, but the best or the first fruits for some other families were birds. They didn't have nearly the value in the sight of culture, but did they have the same value in the sight of God? 
Yes, the New Testament parable, or the New Testament example is the widow's mite. The widow had nothing. She gives a couple of, you know, a couple of pennies, and her gift was much more than the Pharisee that measured out the cumin and the dill and you know, the little bits of everything they had in the house because they were given out of wealth. It was proportionate. It was common sense. I embrace that for us. Now, what that means is, if we teach tithing as a principle and not a law, okay, and we say, hey, it's a good idea to think about giving in the terms of 10%. Let me throw some numbers out at you real quick. J- just one, real quick. Do you know, do you have an idea in general what the average churchgoer gives in our culture today in the United States of America? And I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking about all their charitable giving, period, all rolled up into one. It's about 2%. Okay, it's about it's about two percent. Okay, that that's just things to think about. All right, so let's say this: if we think about it in terms of general rule of thumb, is ten percent. Okay, is every is ten percent going to affect everybody the same way? Yes or no? No. Okay, so we need to start thinking about this. The heart. The heart is the purpose of the gift. It's the motive behind the gift. It's the use of the gift. It's the participation with the gift. God says our giving can be proportionate. So for one family like who, who God has given much to, 10% may not be anything. It may not affect a, a single decision they make at any point in time in the context of an entire year. For another family, 10% may cripple them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like it, it is simply not possible, even though they are conservative and good stewards and live on cash and not on credit and all kinds of things. And that may not be proportionate. So you take the rule of thumb and you start to adjust it. That's what you can do when it's not a legality. You can adjust the number, right? We can use it as a rule of thumb, but now we start to adjust it. And you may say if you have great wealth and if you have great resource, you may say, you know what? I'm not being challenged to be generous in my 10%. It may need to tilt this way. And if you're the family member who says, I have to provide for my home and we're doing everything that we can do and we're, and we're, we're living reasonably, and you may say it has to be adjusted this way. But if it's law, you can't adjust it. Our giving is to be proportionate. God is a, a good God, a loving God, a common sense God. Then he goes on to say, as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. The third one is, it is to be private. Okay? Uh, Paul didn't want to know how much everybody was giving to go to the gift. Uh, just to be frank with you guys, I do not know how much any of y'all are giving, and I don't want to know. Okay? I don't want to know. Now, I will tell you this. I want to know the general, I want to know the general uh, idea of where we're at as a church because I have a responsibility as an elder and an overseer to oversee the church as a whole. Okay? So I want to know the big picture. I do not want to know what any individual is giving, and I do not have that information. Just so you all know. Okay? I think some principles according to this passage is it is to be planned, it is to be proportionate, and it is to be private. The next passage is 2 Corinthians 9 verses 5 through 7. Here's what he says. For I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead of you uh, and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gifts so that the same would would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The principle here is that our giving is to be generous, okay? It is to be generous. Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, reap bountifully. God endorses generous giving. Verse 7, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our giving is to be generous, And it is to be cheerful. It is to be joyous. And if you do not see the heart behind the gift, if you do not see the heart behind this whole idea, then your giving is not going to be cheerful. And there's not going to be fruit from it. Right? You understand what I'm saying? This is my desire. That if you give a dollar, you know, to anything, is that it be given cheerfully. And that there be fruit from that gift because of the manner of which it is given. Generous and cheerfully. Okay? Now I'm going to say something else I'm not supposed to say. All right, here's another thing. 
if you do not feel that you can give to this church, okay, uh, without it violating your conscience, okay, if you do not feel like you're participating in the ministry of the church, if you do not feel like the gospel is going out from this church, if you do not feel like the Holy Spirit is a part of what is happening in this church, and you cannot give to this church in good conscience, I would want you to know that I would rather have the opportunity to minister to you than for you to feel some legalistic requirement of giving money to a church and then feel offended in your conscience and not be able to receive the word here. Is that clear enough for you all? Okay, that's the truth. We'd rather have the opportunity to minister to somebody than to feel like they have to give money or a certain amount of money to be able to be ministered to. Okay, I need you guys to understand that. I want you to feel like you're participating. Um, if you look around our church, if you say, hey, I believe the Holy Spirit is here. If you look around our church and say, I believe that there's mission that is happening here. If you look around our church and say, I believe that there's discipleship happening here. If you look around our church and you say, I believe the Word of God is going out from this church. Okay? One of the ways you can participate in that is through your giving. But if you don't feel like it's participatory of the Lord's Spirit, then I would rather you not than be offended in your own conscience. All right, there we go. That said, um, let's keep going. Why are first fruits important? Why are first fruits important? Now, I need you to open your mind back up. Not just turn in terms of money, in terms of praise, in terms of thanksgiving, in terms of talents, times, and your treasure as well. First fruits as a whole, why are first fruits important? First of all, they keep us dependent and they make us grateful. In Haggai 2 verse 8, it says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. So when you give out of those resources, it means who do they really come from and belong to? They belong to God. What it does is it combats the attitude of this is my money because I did the work. I earned it. I deserved it. So therefore, it's to be spent completely on me. It is a weapon to combat that way of thinking. In a New Testament context, it's dealt with in Matthew 6, 33. Okay? In Matthew 6, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount and he say, man, don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your house. Okay? Every day has got enough worries of its own. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The idea is to stay dependent on the Lord because all of the resources come from him. And one of the ways we stay dependent is to continue to give. And sometimes that is a real exercise of our faith. A strong exercise of our faith. Why are first fruits important? Secondly, as an act of congregational worship. There are too many references there to count, but I'm talking about us praying together, us worshiping together, us giving. We don't pass the offering plate in our church because of our culture that says the only thing that church is about is money. All right, just to be frank. But you have the opportunity because we think it can be an act of congregational worship. You have an opportunity to give. Right here in the back, the tithe boxes are in the back. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, okay? You don't go back there and wave it around, blow a trumpet. Maybe we should put a sign back there. If you give today, hit the button. It makes a big noise, okay? <laughs> like flashing lights go off. No, I do, do it in secret, okay? Because the, the idea is your father is the one who gives those rewards. If we advertise it to everybody and we, we want this, the pat on the back, well, then he goes on to say you've already had your reward in full. Oh, okay. Like I, I, maybe this sounds selfish. I want a little more reward than y'all going, oh man, you put a tenor in there today. Way to go, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like we'd rather have the eternal fruit versus the, the pat on the back from somebody like recognizing something we've done. All right. Uh, third, so that each member of the body experiences participation in the ministry of the church. Participation. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is a great commission. 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Timothy 5, they set a New Testament context for the giving of the church, supporting ministers in the church. Okay, that's the basic idea. You know, we talked about the Levitical tithe in the Old Testament. Well, there's no tribe of Levi anymore, you know, you might be saying, or you might be saying there's no priesthood anymore. Okay, so, so what are we worrying about? Well, it's kind of a New Testament equivalent to that idea. It's a biblical idea to support the work 
of the church. But again, you, you need to understand, or to be in good conscience, I think you're going to want to know that the Lord is using that church for his purposes. You know, I talked about the word of God going out from our church. Jeff told me this week that I think this is fascinating. You may or may not think it's interesting, but I think it's a ministry of our church, okay? Um, I've talked about before, if you serve, whether you clean toilets or set up or tear down or, you know, play in the band or serve our kids or whatever the case may be, you're all supporting the ministry of the gospel, you're all supporting the ministry of the gospel, no matter what the job is, okay? I see it that way. I believe that, all right? We're, we're, a, we're one body working for the common good, all right? Um, besides our attendance that has grown since we've begun as a church, uh, Jeff told me this week that we have between 200 and 250 podcast downloads or message views on YouTube every week. Every week, Okay? Now, for our size of a church, that is fascinating to me. I mean, fascinating. Do y'all know why I think part of that is? I don't think it's because, like, we're the best and we're the coolest and we've got a great C logo that looks good, you know, when it flashes up. I think it's because people even in the church in the West are starving for the Word of God. That's what I believe, okay? And I need you to understand, if you're a part of the church, you're a part of that gospel proclamation that's going forth, Okay? Uh, next reason for importance of first fruits. We talk a lot about symbolism in Scripture and what it stands for. Um, the symbolism of first fruits helps keep our eye on the prize. Okay? Romans 8.23 says this, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Okay? What is the type of first fruit? It's the Holy Spirit of God. Well, awaiting our redemption, okay? I need you to understand that every time you bring, you bring your first fruit, this is another opportunity to be reminded of who we are before God and who it is that we're pursuing with everything that we have, okay? The Holy Spirit is a reminder of that. We will be with God for all of eternity, and he's given us the Holy Spirit as a first fruit, a promise, a sealing of what is to come. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. This goes along with the song that we sang earlier today. Like lightning, you remember? Okay. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrected. Who's coming after him? All of us. All of us. We're going to be resurrected in the manner that Christ was and by the same power. Is that not fascinating? Is that not awesome? Okay. When we bring our first fruits of praise, when we give our first fruits of thanksgiving, when we give the first fruits of our time and our resources and our talents and our abilities, all of those help to remind us that as we bring the first fruits to God, that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrected. And they remind us to keep our hope in the fact that He's coming back to meet with us again and that we will spend eternity with Him. Last one, okay? I talked about the imbalance in prosperity circles a little bit earlier, okay? But this is true. The importance of first fruits is also so that we will prosper, okay? You're not supposed to say that word in conservative circles because y'all are going to misinterpret it. No, it's, it's part of the truth. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says this, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. 2 Corinthians 9, 8-11 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, He scattered abroad, He gave to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now He who supplies need to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Now, one caveat. I do not think that it is a stone-cold lock 
that the more money you give, the more money God will give you. I think it is a stone cold lock that if you give God the first fruits, what will he produce in you? A harvest of what? Righteousness. Okay? It is not a direct relationship with the number that you put on the check. That's not what it is. Okay? It's the idea that as we bring our first fruits to God, that he will bless us with righteousness. How many of y'all would like a little more righteousness in 2019? Yes. Right? Not just money. Time. Talent. Okay, resources. So, here's the summary. This is where we're going to end it today. Offering our first fruits to God means willfully and generously bringing Him our time, treasure, and talents to be used for His purposes. So here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a challenge out to the church. Okay, And again, we'll, we'll share this this week on Facebook as a reminder. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Okay, What I felt like the Lord put on my heart for us this week as a church. And by the way, I do not ask you to do this under compulsion. Okay? I'm encouraging, I'm exhorting, I'm not telling you that in some legal sense this is a requirement if you're going to be a part of our church or anything like that. I'm asking, I'm putting before you, and I'm encouraging that what I'm saying is what I would desire is for every person who is a part of our church to take a day or a meal this week as an individual or with a family to fast and to pray and to ask God to put us in the place where we have the ability to give Him our first fruits in this next year. Does that make sense? Like, I need God to even turn my heart in that direction so that I will have the ability to follow through. Because it is not in me apart from His Holy Spirit. So I'm just asking you to join. Very simply, okay? Do not do it under compulsion. Make a willful, cheerful decision if you would like to join us as a church in that end. Does that make sense? You guys get what I'm asking? Okay? Hey, I want to open up this area down here as an altar. If anyone would like to come down and simply pray on your own during this last song, okay? And you would want to start to pray this prayer right now today. Feel free, man. This area down here, it will be open and you will have the space. And then after worship, if you want to pray with somebody, we'd be glad to. Thank you guys for your attention. Let's pray together and we're going to close in worship today. Father God, I do pray that your heart would come through on all these matters. And and Father, very simply put, if I said anything that was inappropriate or not of your spirit, then I pray that you would just wash that away and that you would forgive me. But Father, anything that was of your heart, that was true to your spirit and according to your word, I pray that it would take root. And the first fruits of these things will be a harvest of righteousness in the lives of our church. And Father, I have no doubt, no doubt at all, that if we collectively, as a lot of individuals, if we bring you the first fruits, I have no doubt that you will use us in miraculous ways. In Joshua, you told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders, amazing things that you could not even imagine among you. I pray that this will be our hope, Father. Is that a group of people dedicated to you with everything that we have would be used as an instrument for your kingdom in a way that we've always wanted to be a part of. That in some ways that we would be the church that we've always wanted to be. And that individually that we would know that we're playing a role in that. So, Father, turn loose your power in our lives. Use our first fruits for your purposes. Pour us out as a sacrifice that you'd be pleased with. In the name of Christ, we pray all these things. Amen.